All right, so we ball things off with cricket on this edition of the Sportsmax Zone. Just like the touring West Indies did earlier today when they won the toss and inserted England on day one of the second test at Trent Bridge. But the Caribbean side had a near-perfect start to proceedings when Alzari Joseph had opener Zach Crawley nicking off to a third slip with a third delivery of the day. That, however, would be the only success for the visitors for some time as Ollie Pope, 121, and Ben Duckett with a rapid 59 ball 71 put on 105 for the second wicket. Pope was gifted two lives on his way to a sixth test century, having been dropped on 46 off the bowling of Jaden Seals in the final over, ahead of the lunch interval, before being given a second opportunity on 54 when he was put down at second slip of Shamar Joseph. Well, he and Harry Brook then put on 59 for the fourth wicket before the former was joined by skipper Ben Stokes, who made 69 for an 80-run stand, which was ended by Elzari, who removed Pope just after tea. Now, the Caribbean side, though far from perfect, showed an improved display to cop the remaining six English wickets in the evening session, eventually dismissing England for 416 in 88.3 overs. Alzari Joseph led the Windies bowlers with figures of 3 for 98, while there were two wickets apiece for spinners, Kavim Hodge, 2 for 44, and Kevin Sinclair, 2 for 73, as well as Jaden Seals, 2 for 90. But West Indies spinner Kevin Sinclair says, despite conceding over 400 runs in the day's play, the Caribbean side are still firmly in the contest. Stuck out there and get 100, um, but yet still, um, I think we did fairly well as a team and as a group to bowl them out. Once again, uh, even getting the wicket of Stokes there when he was looking to tee off, you know, so that was brilliant from us. And I think we really did very well to, you know, bowl them out and get ourselves back in the game. Fazir Mohammed he joins us via Zoom to assess the first day's play and what could have been um, the West Indies um, if they held on to their chances. Well, Faz, good afternoon. Um, West Indies, of course, um, we just heard from Kevin Sinclair saying that, you know, it's not over. They still have the opportunity. What do you say after day one of the second test? Well, of course, it's far from over because we have to wait and see how the West Indies respond. If, if they could actually bat through the entire second day and have wickets in hand going into day three, if that would happen. And uh, in fact, the weather forecast is for even an even better day uh, tomorrow than we had today. So that might be working in the West Indies' favour. So, so yes, it's, it's, it's a situation where we have to wait and see how things go because you can really only properly assess either a pitch or conditions generally after both sides have had an opportunity. England have had their chance. They put 416 on the board. They benefited from numerous chances. They played aggressive cricket. The West Indies bowlers lost their way early on after the early success. They tried to pull things back. But the drop chances, the misstumping, they didn't help the cause. And 416 will take some getting. Yeah, and Faz, you were there. What were your initial thoughts when you saw West Indies won the toss and decided to put England in to bat? Well, I thought uh, putting England into bat was a defensive posture, and and I could understand why, because given what happened last week at uh, at Lords, where the West Indies were dismissed for 121 and 130 something, clearly they didn't want that to be repeated, even if it appeared to be better batting conditions at Trent Bridge. And indeed, many people were surprised that uh, the West Indies chose to bowl first rather than bat first. But again, it's quite clear that the, the confidence levels are low and, and the batting side of things. The players would not have had enough opportunity to really feel comfortable in the environment. And we'll have to wait and see how they shape up tomorrow. But I think that would have clearly influenced the decision to bowl first, apart from the fact that they wanted to extract whatever life they could get from the pitch early on. So, so, so that was quite obvious as to what would have influenced the decision to bowl first. Yeah, and Kevin Sinclair, he came in for Gurukesh Moti, who of course was not feeling well this morning. Kevin Sinclair comes in, makes an impact, and there's something about his energy. I always talk about that backflip celebration and just the way he is 
celebrated and received by his teammates, you know, that sort of energy. Again, he comes into this setup and it's, you know, he, he appears to belong here. He's a very positive character. In the same way, on, on his test debut in Brisbane, in that famous test match victory, he got a half century with the bat, took a couple of important catches, uh, bowled, got got uh, uh, an important wicket. Uh, so all, all of these elements, he got Usman Khawaja, I, I believe, in, the, in that test match in Brisbane. Uh, so uh, many different elements uh, tell you that, look, while he still has quite a bit of work to do as an off-spinner because he needs to turn the ball a bit more, give it a bit more flight, a bit more variation, he is someone who, who really gives off that, that aura of confidence, of, 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 of a positive sort of nature, which is some, sometimes you, you need that. Of course, losing Gurukesh Moti was a setback because he, he woke up this morning not feeling well and therefore he was ruled out. But he bowled well in the test match at Lourdes. He scored a few runs as well. So, so yes, he, he, he was a loss because I, I thought his left arm spin would have been uh, very important as a, a complement to what the fast bowlers had to offer. But, but yes, credit uh, to Kevin Sinclair because whenever he gets his opportunity in any format of the game, whoever he represents, he always seems to give up his best and he always exudes that positivity and energy which a Western East team will need. Faz, I'm a bit worried about Shamar Joseph because this is the second time that, of course, you know, he's leaving because of the injury. Should I be worried? Well, it doesn't appear to be an injury. It appears to be cramp. And okay. it clearly has to do with a lack of work. So, so again, it is, it is really showing up, you know, deficiencies in our preparation. And, you know, people could dance around it how much they want. People could sing all sorts of different songs. When you see a situation where in consecutive matches, someone like a Shamar Joseph was full of energy, full of life, we saw that dramatic spell on the final day in Brisbane, is being hampered with cramp. It tells you that he has not had enough work, enough work under his belt as far as competitive cricket to really get him ready for the demands of Test match cricket. And he bowled well when when, when he was uh, was really up to full speed before he, he got that first bout of cramp. He was bowling well and, and and got the success finally that he didn't get in the Test match at Lords. But again. If you're talking about preparing for Test Match Cricket, people need to re remember that Test Match Cricket is scheduled for five days. And even if it goes two days or two days and a piece as it is at Lords, it's a whole day. It's from 11 o'clock in the morning, British time, to 6, 6.30 in the evening. And therefore, it requires not just physical strength, mental strength, levels of concentration, and a level of preparedness that gets you ready for that. And, and therefore, the fact that Shamar Joseph spent a lot of time since Brisbane to now sitting down on the bench, either in the IPL or in the, World T20, in the T20 World Cup and so many other situations, it, it really begs the question as to whether or not there was a recognition of that and therefore the need to ensure that he had match practice somewhere, maybe coming to England a bit earlier to play some club matches or county matches to get ready for the Test match scene. Yeah, you know, just to build on that point, Faz, because I had a couple of conversations with the veteran commentator, Reds Pereira, heading into the test match, and he had told me that he, he didn't think Shamar Joseph should play the second test match, not because he doesn't think he's a top bowler, but because he felt he lacked proper preparation. And there was even the issue uh, by our understanding that he was allowed to go back home to Guyana after the T20 World Cup and not go directly to the World Cup to join the team in preparation. And because of Hurricane Beryl, it, it affected the travel plan, So, which is why he missed the first, the, the warm-up game there, which could have been a benefit to him as a preparatory exercise for the, for the, test, for the test series. So um, I think as far as Reds is concerned, he probably isn't surprised by the difficulties the young man is having at the moment. Absolutely. And, and I think uh, Rez, Rez talked about that even before the start of the test series, not specifically Shamar Joseph, yes. but he talked about the inadequacy of just having a three-day match then, then to take on England back to back to back in three test matches. And, and I suppose even if they were inclined to say, look, you know, maybe he might not last the test match. Remember, the other option at the moment, Jeremiah Louis, 
has no test match experience at all. And in fact, only came in because of, of the injury to Kemar Roach that ruled him out. So they probably would have calculated that, look, you know, l let's see, uh, uh, based on, on how he's, he's come up in training between the Lord's test and now this second test match, let's go with Shamar Joseph once again, because... Uh, again, he was back on the field towards the, the final end of the final session when the wickets started tumbling. He didn't figure in it, actually bowling. But the, the fact that he was on the field, chasing around on the boundary, suggests that, again, it was another bout of cramp and another example of the issue related to workload and why he might have been struggling with that issue. Yeah, first comment quickly for me on the fluctuating um, efforts of the West Indies in the field today because there were some... Pretty smart catches taken by a couple of players, Athenes and um, Holder, um, who dropped chances which were easier than the ones they took. And there were periods when the West Indies played disciplined cricket and appeared to be working to a plan, but then some loose cricket um, just completely defeated the, the, the good efforts that they were trying to build. And that's precisely it. And how many times have we used the word consistency in our discussions, especially in relation to Test match cricket? A wicket of the, the the first over of the match, and then the next thing you know, England have produced the most the most productive five overs in the history of Test cricket. The fastest fifty since the first Test match was played in 1877, mm. 4.2 overs. So, so that means that almost immediately the initiative had been wrested from the West Indies because of some really poor bowling. It was a succession of half volleys. And to talk about the catching, you know, Lance, this is where the frustration comes in. Yes. Because Jason Holder is one of the safest pair of hands in the world, in the world game. Alec Athena shows that he's comfortable at slip. Yet they miss straightforward chances. And I know people will say, you know, it came hard at them, it probably came too quickly at them. But you're feeling in the slips of fast bowlers, what do you expect? Because this is the highest level of the game. This is That's why it's called test match cricket. In the same way that we expect those catches to be taken, they eventually took them. So this is where the frustrating thing comes in. The, the stumping chance that was missed by Joshua De Silva. Uh, once more, opportunities that go begging that will result in a, in a loss of, 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 of confidence. Your sh shoulders will droop. You saw, you saw hands on hips. Uh, as the, the runs were flowing even in the morning session. But even with that, had that catch been taken just before the end of the session, uh, you would have had the century maker not not getting a chance to even get to 50. So, Oli Pope. So, so there, there you have it. You know, you could talk about issues with batting, about it with experience. You could talk about issues with bowling, with ex about experience. But there really should be no excuse for such an awful day in the field as we saw for the West Indies. Yeah, and one of the things that happens in situations like these, Faz, is that as an opposing team, when you take the pressure of uh, the, in this case, the West Indies taking the pressure of the England batsmen, it allows them psychologically to, to build themselves. And, and, and there were points today, as you alluded to, with those 4.2 overs and 50-odd runs, uh, where the, the English batsmen just treated the West Indies team with disdain. I saw a shot today that Harry Brook played, which was, for me, the shot of the day, a, a, a quick delivery from uh, Alzari Joseph, just marginally outside his off stump. And he just found a way with just backing off a bit used his a powerful wrist um, stroke and just punched the ball over the point boundary for six. Now, usually a shot like that would have been played with a ball wider outside the off stump. So to his credit, he used a lot of skill to, you know, work his way inside the line and get the ball to where he, he, he wanted to. But I, I just thought that moment was just an example of the English batters growing in confidence because the West Indies had, had taken their, their, their feet off the pedal. And that's where the challenge comes in, Lance, because you're, you're playing against a team that plays positive cricket. They play the game on the front foot. Mm -hmm. If it backfires against them, as it did in India, they have to sort things out. And, and they, they, are, they are trying to, to temper it to a certain degree. But as you said correctly, these fellas, when they are in the nets or playing for their counties or playing for their franchises, 
they are practicing all these shots. They are, they are practicing it to the extent that it, it becomes second nature. For many people who recall the 1987 Cricket World Cup, when Mike Gatting played a reverse sweep and was dismissed and it resulted in England losing the final to Australia, he was condemned for it because nobody would do a player shot like that. No, it's, it's almost a surprise if you don't attempt a reverse sweep because it's the most normal thing in the game, whether it's test cricket, whether it's the shorter form, whether it's red ball, whether it's white ball. You mentioned the issue of Harry Brook. It's been talked about extensively that he appears to not be comfortable against short pitched bowling. And many people were surprised that the West Indies didn't immediately pepper him with some short balls as soon as he came to the crease. So, so again, it, it raises the question about either one, recognizing those, those shortcomings, because that's how he fell in the Lord's Test match, miscuing a pull and was easily caught, and, and taking advantage of that situation. So, so yes, it's, there are many different elements to it, Lance, which is why cricket and, and test cricket especially has so many different elements and variables to it and where you could win a session and lose another one so badly that you fall far behind and so many other things. But, but really, it's about really being mindful of who you are bowling to, what, what you know to be their weaknesses, what you know to be their shortcomings, what you know to be their strengths, because sometimes your strength could be your weakness. And it's all about recognizing these things, but having the quality to be consistent in your line of attack as well. Yeah. Faz, talk to me quickly about your assessment of Alzari Joseph, because I heard your Trinbegonian colleague uh, Ian Bishop on commentary today struggling to sort of identify um, Alzari Joseph's troubles, because when he's good, he's really good. But the consistency, that word again, um, isn't there with his bowling. And he has tools because of his, his height and his pace to be a lot more effective than we're seeing him. What are the drawbacks in Azari Joseph's efforts at the moment that, that are preventing him from being as good a bowler as we think he can be? Well, if you can't get a straight answer from one of the great fast bowlers of the West Indies era. What do you expect from me, a non-entity non, non in that regard? And, what and, I would and, a spinner, and a spinner, not a fast bowler. Who barely turned the ball. That's how I used to get my wickets. They played for turn and it was straight through LBW or gold. Uh, but people got onto it eventually and they used to cut me all over the place. But seriously now, de dealing with, with the issue, what I would suggest, it has something to do with temperament. Because you could tell when Alzari is upset, you could tell when he is, he's almost arguing with himself and arguing with teammates when things are not going his way, and he seems to lose focus. Everybody knows he has the ability. He's been really leading the attack in the white ball game. He's been consistent, fairly consistent, in the red ball game for the better part of a year and a piece. Yet on a day like today, when you're looking after that early strike, and we were seeing it again, you're looking for that consistency. You're looking for that, that sort of hostility, aggression, good line, which, which you expect from experienced Test match cricketers. Alzari Joseph has been playing Test cricket not for the last two years, like most of them in the team now. He made his Test debut in 2016. That's eight years ago, and yes, it was off and on for a while, and, but now he's become a regular in the team, and therefore you expect a lot more. So maybe it has to do with his focus, that he, maybe he's, he's thrown off very easily when things happen in the field, when things don't go his way. But again, that is not an excuse. Because you're playing the highest level of the game. You, you, you are expected to deliver because you are a key man in the attack. He's given a leadership responsibility as vice captain as well. And therefore, that, it, that automatically means a level of responsibility and an expectation of some level of consistency in your performance. Yeah, and on that note, Faz, expectation. What are your expectations for the West Indies as they head into the second day of the second test? My expectation is that it won't be easy for the West Indies because you can see, as we saw late on, on, on the first day, that even if it not might, might not be dancing around yeah. or, or, or moving sharply off the seam, there is still enough on this surface to encourage good, quality, excellent bowling. And England, with the raw pace now of Mark Wood, 
with Gus Atkinson from his first test performance, uh, with, with Chris Wokes, with Ben Stokes bowling again, with Troy Bashir finally looking forward to have a bowl with his off spinners. I think what they're going to do from ball one tomorrow is to try to put as much pressure on the West Indies team to build that pressure, deny them scoring opportunities, and if necessary, wait for them to make the mistake. And this is going to be the test for the West Indies. Do they have the application? Do they have not just the technical ability, but the temperamental fortitude to be able to, to battle through long periods without playing a full shot? Faz, thank you so much. We always appreciate your input here on the Sportsmax Zone. Looking forward to talk to you again after day two. Take care. All right, Fazir Mohammed there, of course, he is in London and he's looking on at these tests. We always appreciate when he comes on the Sportsmax Zone. So we'll talk to him again tomorrow. Let's take a quick, quick break and we'll be right back.